African American descent. And so one thing that I wanted to mention is that today, 4% of our donors are Black donors. It's very important because as you just mentioned, you talked a lot about antigens in your opening. Antigens of those African-American donors and Hispanic donors are very important to help those with sickle cell. So again, sickle cell, the transfusion, is something that is essential to patients with sickle cell. I just want to mention is that this is not just a professional mission, but also a personal mission as well. I have a family member that has sickle cell. When you have a family member, it's like the entire family has sickle cell. We've been in the hospital on many occasions waiting for a unit of blood. And so what I would like to say, it's very important to know your status. Knowing your status, my family member, when she did not realize that she had the sickle cell trait, and of course her husband did not know he had the sickle cell trait. So something that we're doing right now with the American Red Cross through June of next year, we are testing every donor that self-identifies as African-American or African, African descent, we are testing for the sickle cell trait. And again, it's very important to know your status. Blood transfusion is very important. And I would like to close by saying every two seconds, someone in the US needs a blood transfusion. So I am asking, as the mayor just says, it just take time for each person to schedule a blood donation and you can visit redcrossblood.org. We also have a nifty little app and that is the blood donor app. It's really cool. Or you can call 1-800-RED-CROSS. And so remember, blood donors can make a huge difference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, I, I hate to ask you to do this, but um, when you were reading the proclamation earlier, our YouTube uh, was not on or uh, and it wasn't recording, I don't believe. So wanted to see if you would mind reading it again. I can share it on my screen if you need me to do that too. But uh, Well, um, do you want me to just do it after at the end of the meeting? Um, so we're, we're not taking up the time of the meeting again, but sure. whatever, you, whatever you like. No, we can do it at the end. That'll okay. be fine. All right. That'll be fine. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, appreciate that. Um, okay. And now, um, if uh, I see uh, Dr. Katie Richardson, um, there she is. Okay, great. Um, um, if we can ask for you to give your report um, at this time, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you again for having me um, this morning. Um, I know we all wish that the COVID were not um, the majority of our agenda um, yet again today, but I will uh, present some information. I'll have it, Dr. Andrews um, give some information specifically about our um, pediatric population um, and hospitalizations and then um, open it up for, and I'd like Maggie to, um, to chime in as well. There's certainly been a lot going on with the school districts around um, COVID. Um, so I just want to um, start with a little data. Um, South Carolina is now ranked sixth in the nation um, for our um, case uh, rates. And um, some of those uh, states around us are decreasing, including Louisiana, Mississippi, and Arkansas, but that is not yet um, the case uh, for South Carolina. So our death rates and our case rates are um, significantly higher um, than the national rates. And that's uh, true for many of our um, partner Southern uh, states as well. CDC gives us a forecast every week for from looking at modeling for what the cases will be doing for the coming weeks. Um, that comes out every Monday. And this Monday, the CDC um, stated that they believe that our cases will continue to increase for the next three weeks. Um, and at that point, um, may level out or even begin to decrease, but that our deaths will continue to increase for that entire four week period. And that's as far out um, as they go. Um, so yesterday we had 4,343 new cases in North Carolina with 29 confirmed. And um, sorry about that. 
and uh, nine, eight probable um, deaths. Greater than 96 percent of our cases now are due to the Delta um, variant. We have over 4.5 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine given in South Carolina. That represents uh, 56.6% of South Carolina's eligible residents that have received one dose and 47.6% that are fully um, vaccinated. And that's of the eligible um, population. Our positivity rate is still very high at 15.8% of all tests uh, coming back um, positive. When we looked at um, age age ranges or age groups um, with these numbers sort of over the summer, so we looked at um, sort of an 11 week period from uh, mid-June to uh, mid-August or early June to later August. And what we saw is the case rates are currently highest in the 11 to 20 year age range. And that is followed by the 10 and under age range. Hence, all the effects that we're seeing on our um, school, schools and school-aged children. When we look at hospitalization um, rates, case rates have increased most in the under 10 age range during that time um, and that, sorry, that's case rates. Hospitalization rates have increased most in the age 31 to 40 year age range, followed by the 21 to 30 year age range. So our hospitalizations um, are definitely, we're seeing more younger people, um, young adults in this case um, involved. And then uh, death rates have increased most in the 51 to 60 year age range. So again, those uh, deaths are are moving down, um, getting younger. Uh, Partially that's due to vaccination uh, rates in our um, older citizens, but also that is due to the the Delta variant and its increased um, severity. So Charleston had 191 confirmed cases um, yesterday and 95 probable uh, cases. Uh, Charleston County has not been rising as steeply over the last week, the cases, um, as in previous weeks, but we don't, it's too soon to know if that is a trend, Um, but we certainly uh, hope that is um, the case. So what we know about Delta variant is it is more transmissible. Um, One sick person can transmit to up to, um, well, to, many people, but an average of around six to nine people, which is much higher than the wild type or alpha um, variant. And we also know um, from recent studies that it is more severe um, than other um, variants. It causes a higher risk of hospitalizations as well as um, deaths. Um, And again, we see not only are are people younger um, being hospitalized, they're sicker, there's a higher need for, um, for oxygen. Um, and finally, we know that risk of hospitalizations and deaths for those who are unvaccinated is much higher, 29 times higher um, than those who are vaccinated. That's a, a recent study out of Los Angeles uh, County. So our hospitalization rates continue to increase. We have over 2,200 people now inpatient across um, the state. That's almost 25% of our entire hospital hospital population um, are diagnosed um, with uh, COVID at this time. Um, And we know, and uh, Meredith and and Annie can speak to this, but when we overburden our healthcare systems, it affects all of us. Because if we need care for ourselves or our families, um, hospitals that are full of COVID patients are not able to take care of the very sick um, in our communities. Um, we are um, seeing the death rates are somewhat lower than they were in January um, of this year, but death rates can lag up to four weeks um, from case rates. And so um, unfortunately we are expecting um, increases in that, but hope that with the increased vaccination rates in our older populations, um, we may be um, spared having sort of um, all time highs in, uh, in deaths, um, although that remains to be seen.
Um, vaccinations are slightly up. That is um, certainly a silver lining, um, but they are not increasing as much as we need them to. Um, so we know that full um, vaccination, at least with the two-dose series, um, does take around four to six weeks. And so this is really a race between vaccinations and the Delta variant. And we can all see that the Delta variant is, um, is winning at this um, point in time. So we are our already seeing and think we will continue to see more in the way of vaccine incentives and vaccine mandates um, from our uh, local businesses. Uh, and, um, and I think that will be a, um, a welcome development. And I know the city of Charleston um, is providing incentives to their uh, city employees and additionally thinking of, um, of policy uh, changes around um, sick leave that may further incentivize uh, those employees. So thank you for being um, a leader in that. Uh, DHEC recently put out some, some data looking at um, those um, cases, hospitalizations, and deaths between the vaccinated and unvaccinated. So this data looks at the last month, mid-July to, uh, to mid-August, 85.5% um, of our cases were in those not considered fully vaccinated. Um, 71.6% of those hospitalized with COVID were not vaccinated, and 78.4% of those who had died from COVID um, are not, um, were not fully um, vaccinated. And moreover, when we look at that group who was vaccinated, among those um, cases that were hospitalized with COVID and fully vaccinated, we were able to determine that 93% of those had pre-existing or comorbid um, conditions. And among the deaths, 94.7% had pre-existing or um, comorbid conditions. So those fully vaccinated who are hospitalized are almost entirely patients with chronic medical conditions, the vast majority of whom are immunocompromised. That leads me into uh, vaccinations. Um, and the good news that on August the 23rd, the FDA did provide full approval for the Pfizer vaccine for all ages 16 and older. Um, we do not yet have definitive news about the vaccine for those in the age five to 11 age group. Um, there is some talk that perhaps um, EUA uh, applications will go to the FDA in October um, for their review um, for that age group. Um, and that would put us on track to hopefully have vaccine for that age group by the end of the year. But that is um, all still remains uh, to be seen. Uh, there has been some talk about um, vaccine effectiveness um, as we uh, see more uh, breakthrough cases. And Dr. Um, Rennert, who is a uh, professor at uh, Clemson University, presented at the COVID Grand Rounds um, yesterday. He did a wonderful job really showing that, you know, 32 studies were assessed by the CDC showing um, basically a vaccine effectiveness uh, with mRNA vaccines of 90% um, overall, 83% for even asymptomatic infections, 95% for preventing hospitalizations. Um, but some of those were done prior to the Delta um, variant. So there is some evidence suggesting that vaccines are less effective against Delta, but it's important to remember that less effective does not imply ineffective. Um, the CDC continues to say, and so does DHEC, that the vac all vaccines that are authorized are effective against severe disease, hospitalizations, and deaths, um, including the Delta variant. A recent New England Journal of Medicine study um, showed 88% um, protection against symptomatic disease in um, England. And um, some of us may have heard um, of an Israeli study that just came out um, earlier uh, this week. Uh, and his, um, his take on this as a biostatistician is that the failure to account for vaccination rates 
um, given the percent that are vaccinated in Israel, as well as the age leads to incorrect conclusions on vaccine um, effectiveness. Um, so knowing that those who are vaccinated are more likely to be an older population compared to those unvaccinated um, and um, and knowing that, you know, with increasing numbers of or percentages of our population being vaccinated, we are going to see uh, more breakthrough um, cases. Uh, so that's, um, I think, worthwhile to um, to check out if, if you haven't. But basically, he says that, that and I believe that this study um, says that regardless of previous infection or vaccination, um, uh, sorry, regardless of whether previous infection or vaccination provide better protection, um, the study concludes that people who had a prior infection still benefit from vaccination to boost their immune response. So this is an observational study. It's yet to be um, peer reviewed. Um, it does not is not consistent with the prior literature. So certainly our research needs to be ongoing. Um, yes, natural immunity um, is real. And we do the CDC and DHEC have said for a long time that at least for 90 days after an infection, um, that protection um, is uh, is present and um, and does does warrant or does allow for, for the need not to quarantine um, or not to test um, for, um, for the infection. But, um, but certainly we do not recommend, and I think this is a huge point that we're trying to get across, anyone to deliberately get infected um, with, uh, with COVID-19 um, as opposed to, um, to getting uh, vaccinated. That's extremely dangerous and just um, doesn't make uh, sense. So um, what else did I want to say? Oh, I did want to speak to the third doses um, and the booster doses. Um, there's been some um, a lot of talk about that. So a third dose is currently recommended um, of um, one of the mRNA vaccines for those individuals who are immunocompromised. And there are very specific definitions for who meets that cr criteria as long as they self-attest uh, to meeting one of those criteria. Um, we do currently recommend that they receive a third dose of an mRNA um, vaccine. Um, however, providers who um, administer a third dose to someone who does not self-attest um, to these um, these various criteria um, may be running the risk of losing liability protection under the PREP Act. So we are um, encouraging providers um, and the public to wait um, for that booster dose, wait for more information from the FDA and the CDC um, prior to seeking that third dose or that booster dose of a vaccine unless you meet the immunocompromised um, criteria. Um, Janssen or the Johnson Johnson vaccine, there are no recommendations around um, the third dose or the booster dose um, currently uh, for that, but that should be um, coming in the, um, in the next uh, few weeks. Um, I wanted to briefly just touch on testing um, and uh, Clemson, again, Dr. Uh, well, there were several presenters from uh, Clemson, but they're doing weekly testing of all students and, um, and staff. Um, and have um, great data showing how much that has decreased their um, infection rates. Um, he recommended targeted testing if, um, if weekly testing was not an option. Basically, when, uh, when two students were found to be positive in a, um, in a residence hall, then they would test everyone in that residence hall. So um, that's obviously a massive undertaking to, to test everyone on a college campus or, or in an organization, but that targeted testing may make a difference um, or likely would make a difference even if, um, if the, the full weekly testing were not available. And lastly, I just want to mention the ivermectin. Um, this is a medication that is being studied, um, but currently there's no evidence to show that it prevents um, or treats um, COVID-19. Um, there have been um, several with um, 
side effects, including severe side effects, especially when taking the increased doses um, given to um, farm animals. Um, and we um, definitely recommend against uh, turning to ivermectin. Monoclonal antibody therapy has been studied and has been found to be effective and is um, increasingly available in our communities. Um, for those who meet criteria, either for having COVID-19 or even for being a close contact um, if it is um, someone that is, as, is at increased risk. So thank you for continuing to do what you can to um, have your family, uh, friends, uh, colleagues vaccinated. And um, I would like to um, turn it over to Dr. Andrews, if that's okay at this point in time, to, to look a little further at our pediatric data. Thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, I'm just going to add a few points to that. So first, the national organization, the American Academy of Pediatrics, has released some numbers. We know that in the week ending in August 26, 204,000 children were diagnosed with COVID just in that week. And that's over five times the number of cases we saw several weeks before. So the week ending July 22nd, there were only 38,000 cases of pediatric COVID. And then fast forward to August 26, 204,000 cases, just to give you an idea of the scale of the problem. Um, also the South Carolina, thank you, Paul, the South Carolina Children's Hospital Collaborative has started doing some sort of unprecedented collaboration to get the word out about what we're seeing in the children's hospital. So they are releasing the data you see here on a daily basis now. And this includes children hospitalized at the four primary children's hospitals in the state, which are McLeod, MUSC, Prisma, Midlands, and Prisma um, upstate. And so you can see here that as of yesterday, there were 26 children hospitalized with COVID. 25 of those were unvaccinated. And about a half of those unvaccinated kids were actually eligible for the vaccination, but had not yet been vaccinated. You can see there's eight children um, in critical care beds across the state, and four of those are on ventilators. So this is unlike anything we saw at any other point during the pandemic. And just anecdotally, I was on service at MUSC last week, and up to half of the patients I was caring for were COVID positive. And at the beginning of this pandemic, I did not care for COVID positive patients because there were so few, they all were located in the ICU. And so we really are seeing a huge uptick in cases. Um, lastly, I will say that along with the Children's Hospital Collaborative, the South Carolina chapter of the AAP is doing some unprecedented things as well because that is our level of concern. So we held a press conference a couple weeks ago with Molly Spearman and Linda Bell to talk about the fact that our goal is to get children back in the classroom. We can all agree that we want kids in the classroom, but to do that, we all have to contribute to their safety by sending our kids to school in masks and getting kids who are eligible for vaccines vaccinated. Last I heard, only 20% of South Carolina youth aged 12 to 17 were fully vaccinated. So we have a lot of work to do in those middle school and high school age kids. And then on a very personal note, I will just say I'm the mother of three children who are not old enough to be vaccinated, who are in the public school system. And I have never felt more vulnerable as a mother sending my kids to school in this situation. So I want to thank you all for everything you've done to promote these basic public health steps like vaccinating and wearing masks and just spread the word as much as you can. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Andrews and Dr. Richardson. Any questions for Dr. Andrews or Dr. Richardson? Uh, Paul. Hi, it's, uh, Carolyn. I have a really quick question. Thank you, and it's always good to see everyone on the call. Uh, my quick question for Dr. Richardson is, um, is there any data regarding vaccination rates among healthcare workers in South Carolina? Thank you. Um, that is a good question. I, um, I don't, I mean, we were, we were reporting that at the beginning, sort of when, uh, when vaccines were only available for that group. Um, there is data around um, nursing home staff. Uh, I know that that um, is the case, and we're, we're seeing increasing um, outbreaks again, unfortunately, um, in our long-term um, care. We 
things. Um, but I don't know if there is data anymore around um, workers in general. I do know that MUSC now requires the vaccine and Roper just as of last week, right after Pfizer was fully approved, um, is also requiring the vaccine as is the VA. Uh, in the Charleston area. But I, yeah, let me see what I can find. I uh, will get back to you about that. Okay, Paul. Thank you. A um, couple of questions along that healthcare. Uh, Katie, we talked about the, the booster shot and, and I guess, you know, the city, we get a lot of questions from our staff, especially our public safety uh, group. They're, they had their shots in January. So they're about at that eight month process. And, and so I guess what is the, what what is the messaging? Um, what is a clear, definitive, any kind of expectations, recommendations the city should be looking at as we, we get to this eight month and nine month process? Uh, the the recommendation is um, it's difficult to wait, but but please be patient and there should be um, more um, definitive recommendations coming out very soon. Um, the federal government did set a tentative date for September 20th to begin boosters for those who have had their second vaccine um, eight months or more ago. Um, and that is one of the two mRNA um, vaccines, but that is still being studied for a definitive recommendation by the FDA and the CDC. Um, the, um, the FDA met earlier um, this week, and, um, and we do expect, because obviously there's planning involved in, in, in taking on um, this, we do expect some more definitive recommendations um, soon. And then for those who received the Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine, um, there's basically a uh, we hope that several studies will be completed shortly. Um, already one has come out that did show an increase in antibody levels with a booster dose of the Johnson Johnson vaccine. So, um, so basically more information to come on all three vaccines, um, whether it will be recommended for everyone or only certain um, groups uh, and, um, and when exactly those, um, those boosters uh, will roll out. I think pretty confident that there will be a recommendation for boosters for at least um, some population uh, groups and that that will begin um, sometime in September, but we just don't have the specifics quite yet. Uh, Paul, did you have another question? Well, I'll yield to the mayor first and then okay. come back to me. Okay, Mayor Tecklenburg. Okay, I'd, it, it's fine if you want to finish up. I, I just wanted to get in the queue to ask a question. Okay, well, I'll proceed. Um, thank you, Dr. Richardson, for uh, that informative report. Um, and, and I'm going to say it one more time that one of the saddest things of this whole pandemic is that um, what is should be purely a public health issue has become a political issue. And so we await the ruling from the Supreme, state Supreme Court in the matters that they heard yesterday about cities and school districts having jurisdiction over uh, having mass mandates and the like. Um, and I, I think I heard you right, but I, honestly, a couple of weeks ago when I was uh, speaking with a couple of other uh, very trusted medical uh, professionals about the Delta variant and how it plays out, I guess the hope at the time two or three weeks ago was and based on what has happened in other places in the world that it, it, it peaks out and then it falls off pretty rapidly. And the expectation a few weeks ago was that we would be peaking about now. And um, but you're telling me that the CDC is saying in South Carolina, we still got maybe two to three more weeks to go before we even get to that peak. Is, is Am I hearing you right? Yes. Yeah, so the CDC, as of Monday, did say that South Carolina, to their 
um, best understanding of the modeling would it would be three more weeks um, of increases um, prior to uh, to reaching that peak. Um, that may not be true in all of South Carolina. We would certainly like to see it um, sooner. Modeling is not an exact science, um, but we certainly we did continue to see increases, you know, over the past week, um, and um, and so that that is there. Um, best understanding of the modeling. And, and, and so I think I know the answer to this question, but uh, just for the record, um, and, and again, I'm presuming that the Supreme Court might give us a clearance, so to speak, to, to um, control our own destiny. Um, I mean, at, at this point, with three weeks to go to peak, I mean, it still makes a difference to wear a mask when you're around other people, right? Absolutely, it does. And, and our DHEX board, Dr. Simmer, our director, um, have continued to say that masking, um, mask mandates are very important, um, that until our um, children under the age of 12 can be vaccinated, this is really their best protection um, and, um, and chance of staying in school. Um, is to um, to have um, universal or as close to possible and to universal uh, masking in those areas. Likewise, in our communities, um, for those who are not vaccinated and those now that are vaccinated um, with our Delta variant, the recommendation is please wear a mask inside in public areas and outside when unable to distance um, from, uh, from others. God bless, thank you. Paul? Katie, my, my question, there's two questions. The, the first one is protocols for close distancing, um, vaccinated and unvaccinated, and especially with children. Um, we're seeing in our workforce and in our community a lot of close contacts every single day. People that have been vaccinated, but some small offices that are really concerned about having a vaccinated person that's been exposed, even though they're wearing the mask in the office and while they're waiting to get tested on day three to five. And I, I'd just like to hear your thoughts because close contacts are really troublesome with, with whether people should be in the office or shouldn't be in the office sometimes, even though we know the vaccination, we've had some breakthroughs, so we know that that is something to be concerned about. Um, yes, yeah, so the first part of your question was about um, distancing and, and children versus adults. So um, there is now guidance that if students are um, three to six feet apart, but both students have a well-fitting mask on, um, that student does not is not considered a close contact. So that is the only group, student to student, um, for which um, that one caveat um, is true. And again, they must both be wearing masks. Um, so for everyone else, it continues to be six feet. And that includes teacher to student, um, adult to adult, college students, um, anyone other than K through 12 um, students who are masked. Uh, that being said, we certainly understand more that aerosol spread is also, um, you know, a, a mode of transmission um, for COVID. So, um, so the more distancing, you know, possible, certainly the better. There's nothing magic about six feet. Um, that is, we just have to draw the line um, somewhere. Uh, so then your question was about sort of um, vaccinated quarantine for vaccinated versus unvaccinated um, close contact. So the CDC and DHEC um, do not recommend um, quarantine for those who are fully vaccinated as long as they are able to mask um, as long as they physically distance as much as possible. And I've given the, um, the uh, example of, you know, if you're meeting in, in a space, the, those that are a, those who have been exposed, even if they're fully vaccinated, my recommendation is sit as far away from others. So you don't have to be home. You are fully vaccinated, but try to physically distance. Please wear your mask. Don't eat with colleagues at lunch where you need to take off your mask during that 14 days after exposure. 
but they may be at work um, if taking those precautions. Now that is a foundation. So certainly I think that the city of Mount Pleasant has gone above and beyond that and does ask for even vaccinated contacts to be out until that negative test comes back at day three to five. So we're certainly never going to say don't do more than our recommendation. Um, but as, as a foundation, as a base, um, if those who are contacts, um, if they are allowed to and choose to return to work um, or to school, we it is definitely with a mask at all times and physical distancing and great hand hygiene. And, and then I'm gonna raise my last hat that I ask every meeting. And since Quentin and Kimberly were part of a, a workshop Charlie and Nine Away did, vaccinations this fall, how important are they that we get our flu shots? Um, it's going to be absolutely vital this year. And um, we are recommending that for those who haven't gotten vaccine, they may get their flu shot and their COVID vaccine on the same day. Um, there's no need to separate um, those out. Uh, we will be returning to um, schools to provide um, flu vaccines. So um, DHEC will be um, doing that. The flu mist will be available again this year. Um, some children um, prefer that. And, um, and so that will be an option. But um, yes, it, it's going to um, really tax our health care uh, system. We're worried about um, flu being worse this year because of it being um, so low last year due to the, uh, the masking and, um, and that those symptoms have so much overlap uh, that it's going to be very difficult to tease out without testing. Um, a whole lot of people with, uh, with respiratory uh, symptoms. So definitely flu vaccine will be important as will, and we talked about the boosters, but the priority is definitely still needs to be on the biggest bang for our buck is getting those who are unvaccinated um, through their first series, that for first dose of Johnson Johnson or the series of the two RNA, RNA, mRNA vaccines, sorry. Okay. Any other any other questions for Dr. Richardson or Dr. Andrews? Um, well, thank you for that very thorough report. A lot of very important information out of there, and um, we we appreciate you spreading that. And Carolyn, we thank you as a member of the media for getting this word out. So uh, thank you to to all of you. Um, so we'll move on now. Um, Dr. Kimberly Butler Willis is with us. She, as most of you know, she serves on the Health Disparities and Environmental Justice Subcommittee, which is a special, which is part of the Special Committee on Equity, Inclusion, and Racial Reconciliation. Uh, so if you would, please give us an update. Sure thing. Thanks, Kevin. So uh, an update this morning, we were able to present the final report, our Amber presented on our behalf, the final report at the city council meeting on August 17th. And it was, um, it was a meeting to say the least. We had about 80 plus uh, citizens that came up to uh, speak during the meeting. So it made it very long, but this was also the time where we, where the city had just announced the mask mandate, which we were pretty grateful for, but uh, not everyone had the same sentiments. So it was a, a it was an overwhelming meeting, but yet there were still some comments about the report in general. Um, some people were a little bit uh, unhappy with word choices that weren't really in the report, but they assumed they were like reparations or critical race theory. Um, those were the two words that I heard most often, which uh, I'll tell you guys, um, critical race theory is not in, our defund the police is not in the final report. And so we also asked at that meeting if um, the city would consider creating a commission that was longstanding so right now, this commission is a special commission. And so, Mayor, please correct me with my terminology, but um, it's just supposed to be temporary. So it was suggested that they create a commission that would be longstanding for city council. And then it was also asked that they would um, act on the recommendations within that report. So that was tabled so that we have more time for conversation, discussion, not just among the council, but also with constituents so that they have a better understanding of what's in that report. It's a dense document. And so it takes some time to work through. 
And so I'm encouraging you guys to read the report as well. Uh, host listening sessions if you can. Um, invite people from that commission to come on out and speak to their parts. Um, if anyone has any questions about the health disparities and environmental justice section, you can reach out to me or Paul. He worked with me on that subcommittee as well. But um, there's some information I think we could all learn and certainly some valuable information that would truly move Charleston in the right direction if we're committed to equity. Um, the next council meeting is September 21st. Is that right, Mayor? No, it would be on September the 14th. 14th. Is it the first and third Tuesdays? We're back to first and third. Uh, I'm sorry, we're back to second and fourth. Second uh, and fourth. Okay. So on second and fourth Tuesdays are city council meetings. And so if you do want to add um, conversation thoughts or opinions about that report, we encourage you to go to those meetings. Make sure you sign up so that you can have um, an opportunity to speak and you can do that virtually or in person. Um, any questions, Mayor, anything to add? Well, I, I did want to make clear, we gave first reading to the formation of uh, a more permanent commission to, to um, take up all these matters. And um, if, if there was any doubt about the city uh, accepting or receiving the recommendations for further review, I, I did that personally and uh, am directing um, the recommendations back out to the appropriate uh, city council committees. And in, in the case of uh, wellness related recommendations, I'm going to refer them back to this very committee right here. So um, I, I do ask for you all to take the uh, recommendations from Dr. Willis and and read them over. And, and I think we ought to have like um, either the next meeting or two, like a, a dedicated meeting just to go over these one by one and, and, and really brainstorm about actions that we would recommend to council, um, you know, as a re result of, of um, the recommendations. Does that make sense? Perfect sense. And that's a great idea. I think mm -hmm. um, most of what we have in there, you guys will already know. Um, but it would be great to have your feedback because I'm sure everything can always be improved. That's right. I, and I, I'd like, you know, it to become an official review of, of this body and, and so that you can report back to city council, uh, the ones that you, you really feel strongly about or the, the ones that you feel like we ought to prioritize and, and try to move forward with and um, kind of, help us quell this conversation uh, honestly about the work of the commission. It was really positive work. And uh, as Dr. Willis said, some, some people pick up on buzzwords and they, they want to crash and burn things. And uh, there's a lot of good work, um, a lot of good recommendations in the co commission's work. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Mayor. And Paul, maybe I can send out, or we can send this out to the to the committee so that you guys have time to review prior to our next meeting so that when we come back together, just as the mayor suggested, we can answer questions, but we can walk through each strategy one by one. And rather than going through each objective under the strategy or each point under the strategy, uh, we can use more time on Q&A. So if you have a month to review the document, email me any uh, immediate questions you have, but we can certainly discuss uh, when we come back together in October. It's October, y'all, October. Yeah, I, I did share that in our email out on, when, on Monday, and I also put a link to the entire document of the 500 page document um, as well too. So, but they do have a copy of what I just put on the screen was sent to them. I should have known. Y'all know Paul is on it. And so you guys already have it. So again, email me if you have any questions, but we'll discuss further next month. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Butler Willis. We appreciate uh, your report and uh, all that you're doing. So thank you very much. Um, if there's no other questions there, we will move on to our community updates. Um, I know Holly left a little bit early. She apologized on the chat, but I do see Maggie here. If Maggie wants to Maggie, do you have anything from Charleston County Schools? Hi, yes, um, thanks so much. So <clears throat> um, as Dr. Richardson was sharing, you know, we, we are certainly um, it, 
excited to have students back, but also, you know, working as hard as possible to keep all of our staff and students and families as safe as possible. Um, we do currently have three schools, virtually learning early college high school and starting today, Sullivan's Island Elementary and Charles Pinckney Elementary um, due to the number of cases in those areas. Um, and so those schools will learn virtually for 14 days um, and with increased sanitization while um, the students are out of the building in an effort um, to keep everyone as safe as possible. Um, and certainly we'll continue making decisions on a case by case, school by school basis um, in an effort to, to protect the health and safety of our students, but also um, still afford you know, in-person learning opportunities where it's safe to do so. Um, <clears throat> we do have a COVID-19 dashboard. Um, we had that last year, we have it this year again, it's on our um, ccsdschools.com. Um, due to the high incidence rate and um, the enormous effort of our nurses um, doing around the clock, literally around the clock contact tracing, um, that dashboard is now updated twice a day, once at 9 a.m. and once at 5 p.m. Um, in order to get um, the most accurate numbers on there as possible. Um, additionally, when we have cases reported over the weekend, um, Saturday cases roll back to the previous week to Friday and Sunday cases roll forward um, to the upcoming week to that Monday. So that's just kind of an update there on our um, outward facing reporting mechanisms. Um, and as well as, you know, we have um, a mask requirement that our board of trustees passed and um, our board chairman uh, made a statement at our last board of trustees meeting on August the 23rd, um, just sharing the importance of that requirement and um, the plea and encouragement for, for everyone to follow that requirement. Um, and so, you know, we remain um, dedicated to uh, having our, our students be safe and encouraging that requirement um, across all of our facilities. All right, well, thank you very much. Any, any questions on, for Charleston County Schools for Maggie? Councilmember right. Sheely, it's Lori. I have a quick question. Any, yeah, Lori, uh, thank you. Any athletic teams on pause in the district or any anything going on with sports teams that would be helpful for me to know? Um, sure. So we, you know, are still using our cohorting um, protocols where possible with all of our athletic teams where we're you know, putting our quarterbacks together and our linemen together to minimize um, how many students need to go in quarantine when a positive case arises. Um, I do you believe we have a JV football team in quarantine right now? Um, I'm, I'm not totally certain, but we have had several um, varsity and JV teams go in and out of quarantine since the beginning of school. Um, and then we've had several um, athletic matches canceled either because our team was in quarantine or the um, opponent was in quarantine. Thanks. No, um, no conversations or any kind of pause to sports or anything like that at this point. It's just been as it's popped up. Yes, I'm correct. Um, just case by case basis currently and really trying to minimize the number of students that are affected by continuing cohort. Um, we do follow um, in our superintendent's report, we, you know, we are following the 10 day quarantine um, recommendation from DHEC with um, four days of monitoring once students come back to school um, for their, their health vitals um, as they're there just to ensure that they're not transitioning to a positive case. Paul, Thank did you, you have a Maggie. question? Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Paul? Well, Maggie, I just want to ask a question. I want Katie and you both to weigh in on it. Outdoor events, football games, um, high school level, even the state level where these large crowds are going on or other big events like that. What, what are we um, doing to try to help minimize spreads of those areas? Um, well, DHEC continues to recommend the same things that we have been recommending as far as, um, in, you know, when, when unable to distance wearing masks. So that would be, you know, coming in and out of events where, uh, where people may be closer together um, than that six feet uh, range. The, the distancing does not change, you know, outside versus inside. We know certainly outside is um, less risk generally, but we know that the Delta
is more transmissible. Um, and so we, as much as possible, physically distancing um, is, um, is vital. Um, sanitation around frequently used areas such as uh, bathrooms. Um, and, um, and then we're not, we're not putting any sort of, um, uh, the words not coming to me right now, but we're not going to say at this point in time, you know, that, that certain sizes are prohibited um, for, uh, for gatherings, um, but that would be something that we certainly would hope that municipalities um, and counties would consider based on um, transmission uh, rates, um, as well as uh, at schools. Do, yes. do, we, do we know what the colleges like Clemson and all these big uh, Carolina are doing with their football games? Are they doing anything in the bleachers or anything special? Um, that is a guy, not that I know of, um, but maybe, um, uh, maybe Kimbo can speak to that. Now, Paul, as far as I know, most major colleges, including the Citadel, when it comes to football games, they have encouragement of wearing masks and they'll provide sanitation. But, uh, I believe what I followed is most of them will not require that you wear a mask and there will be no spacing out in the crowd. So, most stadiums or most schools are planning full capacity for this football season. Thank you. I, I can't yes. speak to the University of South Carolina. That is what they're doing at williams Bryce Stadium, Paul, in case you want to go watch a really good team like play football in Columbia. <laughs> uh, from our standpoint, um, certainly in our mask requirement applies to in, inside of our facilities. Um, and so, you know, certainly with, with any events, they'll follow um, distancing protocols in terms of capacity. Um, I believe it's three foot center to center um, for those for indoor facilities, outdoor facilities. I do believe, I do believe that, that we still have some capacity requirements in place, um, especially when it comes to um, ticketing of our events. So we'll, you know, continue to try to provide um, a safe environment there. And of course we, we have, you know, similar to last year and sanitizing stations everywhere. Um, our water fountains are shut off. So only um, water bottle reef uh, abilities there um, in sanitization as well. Okay. Um, Jennifer Roberts, do you have anything that you wanted to share with us? I do. Thank you. I'll be I'll be quick because I see it's 10 o'clock. Um, I just I wanted to share with everyone that uh, September is also Suicide Awareness Month, with September 10th being Suicide Awareness Day. Um, and just wanted to share some statistics since this group loves numbers so much. Um, not good numbers on this one, but um, suicide is the 10th le leading cause of death. Um, it's second leading cause for ages 10 to 20 or 10 to 34. Fourth leading cause of death for 35 to 44. Um, and interestingly, so this is two, 2019 statistics. Um, two and a half suicide was two and a half times more likely than, or ha happened more often than, than homicides in 2019. Um, and males are 3.7 times more likely to die by suicide. So, with all that being said, um, there's a lot, there'll be a lot of suicide <laughs> awareness um, events and things happening in September. I just want to remind everyone that the Department of Mental Health has a suicide prevention uh, division and we offer free trainings of various types to agencies, organizations, churches, individuals. Um, and then also our mental health center also provides free mental health first aid training. Um, so if anyone is interested in learning more about how to recognize signs and symptoms of mental illness or suicide, please reach out to me and let me know. All right, thank you very much. Any questions? All right, uh, Meredith Belinsky, did you have anything from Roper? No, I'll just just say like Jennifer said I'll keep that keep that quick. We, as of two days ago, we have 139 COVID cases in house, um, and the majority of those are are not vaccinated. So, um, Dr. Richards and um, Dr. Andrew, um, and Israel, you know, talk, just talking about the, 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 the that's turning into a necessity 
And um, <clears throat> there's a lot of talk between um, within hospitals we have, we do have some teammates out. We do, um, like they're asking about the, the number of, of, of healthcare providers. That would be a great so, uh, stat to know, but we, we don't, I don't have that information as well, but um, uh, two of my teammates have actually gone out with COVID recently. So it's starting to, um, it's starting to affect the rest of us as well. So we, we, and we don't want to push anybody that actually have other healthcare concerns and other healthcare emergencies, not to visit your hospital. That's, we're, we're still here for that. We are very busy. Yes, but um, we still care for our community and, and um, uh, we don't want people to think I'm, well, I have this, I can't just go to that hospital because they have COVID. We have their, those patients are in different and safe areas um, for all of us. So we, um, we're, we're taking care of everybody just like we always have. And uh, we just want to spread that if you do have other health emergencies, that that's what we are here for and to, um, that we will do the best we can. Thank you very much. Uh, Kimbo, I know you spoke on, um, on football, but did you have anything else you wanted to report from the Citadel? Yeah, so uh, currently the Citadel does have a mask mandate for faculty, staff, and students in place. Uh, that's different from when we last met. Most major colleges and institutions now have a mask mandate of some sort for their campus communities. Ours is for three weeks until September 7th, and then at that time we'll be looking at the data to decide if we want to renew it. Uh, this matches what Clemson University is doing as well as what their public health experts have said in terms of where we're going to hit that peak after that three week period to start the semester. Uh, currently our cases are pretty high or as high as where they were in January. So uh, if the cases still stay high or continue to go high, we'll likely renew for another three weeks. Um, we're still encouraging vaccine um, for our community. We're providing incentives for students to get vaccinated. Uh, about 400 of our students are actually being mandated to get the vaccine because they are military deployments. So um, the Def uh, Department of Defense, the Pentagon have said that all military service personnel by September 15th need to be mac um, vaccinated. So that includes about 400 of our students. And um, I guess the last thing I'll say is just uh, every Wednesday, we normally have open COVID testing, and we weren't able to do that today because of what we're seeing in the community and what we're seeing around the state, that there's just been such an increase in the demand for COVID testing that there's no supplies available for us to do that. So appointments are filling up everywhere, lines are very long, so we hope to restart that again next week, but uh, we'll see what is going on with testing around the county. So, Thank you very much. Um, anyone else who would like to report out? on our community update. Councilman Sheely, this is Quentin from yeah, MUSC. I'll just, I know we're short on time. Just want to throw out, we still have sites around the city uh, where we are providing testing. Uh, some were vaccine sites and we've now converted them over to testing sites because the demand has gone up. But just to throw out a few that we have running and you can check our website to see exactly what we're offering at those sites. We are at the, I think the Meeting Street Visitor Center Edmonds O's uh, once a week, the airport, uh, Lockwood, our Lockwood uh, at the old DMV um, facility. We're continuing to offer vaccines each day. Earhart Street, we're offering um, uh, testing each day. Uh, we're also doing some testing, was vaccines, but now testing at 180 place. And we, I know you've probably heard over the last few weeks that there's a shortage of folks that are offering the uh, monoclonal antibody treatment, the infusion uh, that helps to treat um, uh, COVID. Uh, we have now expanded our capacity out at the Citadel Mall at the old Tattooed Moose um, uh, facility there. And so now we have expanded our operations to be able to offer more uh, infusions out there at that facility. So again, you can just check our website to get the days, the times, and what's offered at those sites, but just wanted to let you know that we're still out and about uh, trying to make sure that we do our part with testing and vaccines throughout the city of Charleston and the state, so. All right, thank you, Quinn. We appreciate what you do. Thank you so much. All right, Paul? Quinn, are there any special um, qualifications to be able to get the uh, antibody um, infusions? Well, I'd leave it up to the clinicians to give you the specific details of it, but it is time sensitive. Uh, you do need to catch it early. And um, I would just say consult with your physicians about 
uh, what that time frame is, but it's it's early on when you're first diagnosed. So the uh, right conditions are on the the DHEC website and and I'm sure on the MUSC uh, website as well. It has it has broadened. Um, so there's both an age, I think anyone 65 and over, uh, but many of those younger with comorbid conditions um, also um, qualify, even, um, even children. Uh, and so that um, I would encourage anyone to, uh, to look into um, whether they qualify, speak to their provider, as Clinton said. All right. Anyone else on community update? Um, if we could, Mr. Mayor, um, if we can read that proclamation on sickle cell, if we, if we could still do that so that we have that on YouTube. Um, I'll be right back. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, uh, just thank you to everybody while he's, uh, while he's grabbing that for being here. A lot of great information. I apologize that we've gone over a few minutes and, uh, like I always say, we really appreciate, um, your time. You add so much value to the city of Charleston. So, Thank you to everybody for uh, putting in your time today and, and reporting out and giving us some great information. Thank you, everybody. We're not through this yet. <laughs> All right, um, no need for y'all to stay on. I, I'll uh, read the proclamation again for the record. Um, this proclamation from the city of Charleston, whereas sickle cell disease is a chronic debilitating inherited condition that affects approximately 100,000 Americans, primarily African Americans and Hispanic Americans. And whereas one in 13 African Americans and approximately one in 100 Hispanic Americans carry the gene for this disease. Whereas while there is no cure, the most effective treatment for sickle cell disease patients is a blood transfusion. Many patients are able to locate a blood type match through donors of the same race or ethnicity. And whereas in order to make blood transfusions for sickle cell patients available, our nation's hospitals and medical centers must have a sufficient readily available blood supply. And whereas Charleston is home of a number of committed public and private organizations working to raise awareness of the importance of blood donation, including the American Red Cross and the COBRA sickle cell program in Charleston. And whereas sickle cell disease awareness month effectively served to remind us of the need to constantly replenish our nation's blood supply through donation and community awareness so that those in need of a blood transfusion may receive one. And whereas in honor of Sickle Cell Disease Awareness Month and throughout the year, the people of Charleston are urged to support local blood drives and help to raise awareness of this disease and the available treatment. Therefore, I, John J. Tecklenburg, Mayor of the City of Charleston, do hereby proclaim September 2021 as Sickle Cell Disease Awareness Month in the City of Charleston. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate you doing that a second time and uh, appreciate everybody that, that stayed on one more time. So thank you and uh, I hope you have a great rest of your week. If there's nothing else for this committee, we are adjourned. Thank you so thank much. You, Chairman. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Always great to see everybody. See you next.